when I'm too old to go out in the field. And guess what? That's all kept in a bank safe in our building. And the idea was that even if the building burns down, this bank safe sinks down through seven stories of the building as it burns, and all of the information is kept intact. That's probably not true, but they always said that. Okay, so here's what bird specimens look like. You can see right away this is nothing as neat and organized as the herbarium specimens that we were looking at yesterday, where they're very nice and easy to store on shelves. These things have different shapes and sizes. They're all three-dimensional. And the worst thing is our specimen tags. Because think about that, that imaging apparatus you saw yesterday. It took the herbarium sheet and it pressed it up against a scanner and you get the whole label, even if you know, the information is in four different places on the, on the sheet. In our case, not only is the information on this little tag tied to this round bird, but worse yet, the tag is set up so that you have to flip it and then you get the other side. So there's no way we can speed up imaging our labels. We have other collection types like eggs, and this is, in some senses, even worse because they're so delicate. But the eggs are essentially preserved in cotton and acid-free plastic boxes. The label is set on the cotton, not attached to the eggs. So you have the danger of getting a label separated from the specimen. Um, the older labels in egg collections are really bad because so essentially the way you prepare an egg specimen is you drill a hole in the side of the egg, just one hole, not the way you do, you know, for like for a kid's celebration where you, you blow two holes. One hole in the side, you blow air in and all the contents comes out. But what the old time collectors would do is put little codes around that hole and then those codes would refer out to a card system. If you don't understand the codes, you lose all the data. And basically right now in the world, there are three people on Earth who really understand those historical codes. One of them is post-retirement, one of them is nearing retirement, and one of them is fairly young. So even in ornithology, we can lose a whole dimension of our collections just because nobody understands these codes anymore. And then, as I said, perhaps our worst form of, of specimens as far as information management is this. These are specimens in alcohol. They're originally fixed in formalin, and then we pass them to alcohol. But what you can see here is sometimes you just have a field number, and that refers out either to a label on the bottle or to the ledgers. Sometimes you put in a full label, but those labels are pretty delicate when they've been sitting in fluid for years. So this to me is, is you know, the dark frontier, the, the part of my collection that I really don't want to go to. You know, we're going there, but I didn't want to. Um, and then this is what kind of the final collection looks like. And you see the skins very carefully organized by species. And basically, they're sitting on a mat of, of acid-free paper, and then they're isolated from any damaging substances in the trays by a, a, a piece of foam that's also inert. So it's, it's quite an expensive and space-consuming endeavor. And that's what the cabinets look like. That's my office over there. Um, so, that's kind of a quick tour of our collection. That is the U.S. National Museum. This, this is one of my favorite pictures. Roxy Laybourne, now deceased, was the expert in forensic ornithology. This was before barcoding and all that. And so, you know, the FBI or the customs uh, agents would find some remains of a bird in something that was illegal and they would bring Roxy a tiny little piece of a feather and she was the world expert in identifying tiny pieces of birds to species. 
She was fantastic. But this is obviously something they did for a photo opportunity, and they pulled out most drawers in, in one main hall of the collection. That collection is around seven or 800,000 birds. It's a huge collection. Um, so then I just wanted to show you some labels and show you essentially what the information looks like. And I took advantage of a set of birds that was sitting outside my office in a cabinet. Uh, these are called uh, crossbills. You can't really see it, but the bill is literally asymmetric. And it's for pulling seeds out of pine cones. Um, loxia kind of means asymmetric. But if you look carefully at this, you'll see Loxia curvirostri, that's the genus and species. Somebody originally had written Ben Diary. Notice this is in pen and this is in pencil. The normal curatorial procedure is that the species ID is always in pencil because the species ID can change, but you never erase. Instead, here's a man named ARP, Alan R. Phillips, who was an amazing but not always positive force in ornithology in the 20th century. And he comes in and he, sa he scratches out Ben Diary. He says it's closer to this than this. And he puts down ARP 1975 and 1976. And we'll, we'll see more and more of his annotations because he would always come to the University of Kansas and annotate our specimens according to his beliefs, which are not the only beliefs. Um, so here, you know, equals worn and faded. I don't know what this pH plus minus is. Not typical, too yellow below, not ochre, rump question mark. That's a pretty typical Phillips annotation. And ideally, we'd capture all of that. It's going to take a lot of time. On the back side, you can even see Phillips confirming this. It says sex question mark because the lower back was destroyed. A lot of our specimens we collect by gunshot. And sometimes the gunshot goes bad and the bird is not complete. So this is one where the, the gonads weren't visible. And so the collector correctly put female by plumage. Doesn't mean it's a female, it's just that it, it has a female plumage. These days we could sequence some sex-linked DNA segment and get an answer. But female by plumage and Phillips comes in and says yes. He's confirming that. Then we have some measurements. And remember I said earlier that we tend not to capture the measurements because they're person specific. Then we get our our locality, Kansas, Mead County, Mead, Mead State Park. So notice that's not a point. It's the Mead State Park is going to be some sort of polygon. We'll come back to those questions when we talk about georeferencing. <coughs> There's a body mass. And then we get some coding. And these are dangerous. You know, I know these codes because I've been doing this for 30 years. That means skull completely ossified. But we try to avoid those codes because sometimes they're not completely explicit. A date, a collector, and a collector number. Okay? Another example, this is an older one from 1887. There you can see the crossed bill, like that. Um, again, you can see ARP 73. And he's saying it's near Sitkensis, which is a subspecies. You can also see the older original label. Okay. And notice it was, it was identified as a different subspecies previously. There's a different collector number. And some very sketchy notes. We're not doing OCR on these labels, are we? Okay, skeletons. So remember I told you we, we employ large numbers of beetles to do our work for us as, as curators. Um, essentially, the mummified body is placed in a little container inside a colony of domestic beetles. And a couple of days or a week later, 
they've usually removed all the meat. Um, we have, I believe it's the third largest skeleton collection in North America, so it's pretty significant. Now, that is a dodo, and that's probably what you're expecting when you think about a bird skeleton. Nicely articulated where somebody's connected each set of bones. But really what our specimens look like is this, which is to say it's all disarticulated and tossed in a box with a label. Because that's the way the scientist is going to want it. You don't want some delicate mount. You want to be able to pull out the femur and compare it to the femur of, of some other individual. Um, so the labels go on the tops of the boxes. Um, oftentimes what you'll have is a field label that accompanied the skeleton all the way through its preparation. Uh, actually, that, that I guess is a catalog number, but we'll see field la labels in a moment. And then you'll, you see the data. And this is a newer one. This is uh, a student who just got his, um, just got his PhD. Um, and you can see we've got quite a bit more detail in the georeferencing. This is a system that is used to locate parcels of land in the central U.S. So it's not a system you'd be familiar with. Um, and then sometimes you get the full data label. Okay? And then back to our fluid collections. These are in a separate annex behind our building. The reason being is that it's thousands of gallons of ethanol and it is all technically inflammable. Um, it was very, very important to get this collection into a fire controlled area. But even so, with a, a very large construction project, what they've told us is if this facility were really to blow up, they've got about a 10 minute barrier between that and the rest of the building. So if it were up to me, I'd move the rest of my collections to another building. This is too dangerous. And this is also where we do information management the worst. So there's some little tag on the foot of the bird and that keys out to this and you see it says, you know, 52801 Jalisco, Mexico. I assume that on that bird there's more information than state and country. Uh, this is a bit better. This is in the herpetology collections. Uh, and you can see a full locality. Uh, but it's still fragmentary. Essentially, notice the labels are inside. So they're in fluid, they're curved. So in the case of this collection, I would be thinking about just getting the catalog number and going out to the ledgers. And then doing a verification step and coming back to the specimens. But this is tough. This is the hardest part of our collection. So, generalities are birds and mammals and amphibians and reptiles and fishes are irregular in shape. You, know, you can see some of the, I don't know why there's a wing backwards on that bird in that photograph, uh, but you can see that things are, this isn't my collection by the way, we wouldn't have our specimens on top of each other that way. But you can see that these shapes and sizes are very irregular and that's going to constrain a lot of what we do. Um, older specimens can even be mounted and those are even more awkward to handle. Okay, So there's no possibility that we're going to automate major parts of this process. The data presentation is extremely irregular. There are occasionally situations in which